You're watching the First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas video podcast. To learn more about our church or to listen to an audio-only version of this sermon, please visit us online at fbcmf.org. Here we go. Uh, We are talking about Rethink Love. We talked about Rethink Love. We talked about Rethink Marriage. Then we talked about Rethink Singleness. And this morning is Rethink Infidelity. And then next week is Rethink Sexuality. And uh, there are uh, tough sermons to do. And uh, it's, it's very personal, but you can't talk about these things. And it's impossible to read scripture without it getting very, very personal. Uh, and so the slogan for the Ashley Madison website is, life is short, have an affair. Life is short, have an affair. And, uh, and so apparently 32 million people have and it was breached, and all of their information was sent out uh, to the public. So all of the people who thought that their infidelity was really secret, they were all discovered. And, And let that be the first kind of lesson, that if anybody has an affair, you're gonna get caught, and it's dangerous. And the first person who knows and catches you is God. And, uh, but you can't hide it forever. So all these people who thought they were real safe, 32 million, they were all caught. And then it wreaked havoc on their lives. 400 uh, of them were preachers and uh, pastors. And, four, and all of 400 of those guys had to resign their churches or they were fired. Uh, there was a seminary professor at a Baptist, um, the, this is the one that we know of, a Baptist theological seminary called uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. A professor was on there, and, uh, and, and it, it, he was exposed. He was one of the people who were exposed, and, and he had such shame that a few weeks ago he committed suicide. And he just couldn't live with the shame, he says. They should put that on the website. The pharmaceutical companies, when they begin to tell you, you need to buy this drug or this drug or whatever it is, Um, and and it looks pretty good, doesn't it, until when? Yeah, Yeah. Uh, until they say, here are the side effects, and then it lists them, and they're a mile long, and you're going to have all that. That's what that should do. Life is short, have an affair, and then they can church it up all they want, but then they they need to show um, the casket, and they need to show the children crying, and the wife crying, and suicide, and then they need to show the financial ruin, and they need to show all of the people crying, um, and wives and husbands and those marital vows being torn apart and the utter destruction that it causes. That's what they should do, um, but, but they don't. All they do is they make you feel, and they, they, they do this to all of us, they want you to feel like you're missing out if all you're doing is having sex with your spouse. You're missing out, the party is over here, and, uh, and they make you feel like that. And so this morning, how do we protect our marriages? If your marriage means a lot to you, and if it's a covenant marriage, is there any kind of real um, practical ways that we can protect it? Now, y'all, nobody has a perfect marriage, but you can have a great marriage, and Jesus wants you to have a great marriage and a fulfilling marriage and a satisfying marriage. He doesn't want anyone to become divorced because he knows that divorce is so incredibly painful. And he wants you to protect your marriage from all of that pain and all of that suffering that's sure to happen. So how do you do that? How do you protect your marriage? I want to, I want to start with a statement. And I want you to know that I don't like this statement. Uh, I don't really like saying it, but I say it for the shock value and and some because I I believe that there is some validity to it. And and here's the statement. You just need to understand that your husband or your wife does not have to stay with you. You really need to understand that. You really need to understand every one of us, our church staff, yes. Over everyone needs to understand your husband or your wife does not have to stay with you. Now, they ought to stay with you. They should. The Bible tells them. The Bible doesn't just suggest that we are devoted to our spouse. It doesn't just say that. The Bible says you're commanded 
that you cannot leave your spouse. You're commanded that you have to stay with them. But we have all been around long enough that Christians do not always obey the Bible, do they? And, and because of that, this statement that the Bible says to stay married, 30 to 60% of, of even Christians are not staying married. They're not doing what the Bible says. And so your husband or your spouse doesn't have to do it. They could choose to disobey the Bible and hurt you and go. So how do you protect that? A lot of people walk away from their marital vows. And, and some people will say, man, 30 to 60, that's lower, isn't it, than the way that it used to be? And it is a little bit lower. But before you celebrate it, uh, we, we need to realize the reason that it's a little lower is because a lot of people aren't getting married in the first place. They're just living together. And, and when they choose to do that, then, it's, uh, then there's not as big of a divorce rate. But really, if you put all everybody together, really we're looking at the same numbers, same very hurtful statistics that we've been looking at for a long time. And so do you all know the number one threat? The number one threat to all marriages is infidelity. Um, people will say, no, it, you know, it could be financial problems. And man, absolutely. If you have financial problems, it is hard. You, you go to bed at night with them. You wake up in the morning with them. Financial problems are a real drag. But that's not the number one threat. Some people say, well, no, the number one threat is a lack of commitment. And that's hard too. But it's not number one. And you know what? A inability to communicate well with your spouse. If, uh, husbands and wives, you, if you communicate very differently... Uh, most men and women communicate differently with one another, and that does create a problem. It's hard to work through that, but that's not the number one reason that marriages fall apart. It's not communication. Some other person suggested that the reason that marriages will fall apart is because of a change in priorities, that you all of a sudden, you, you had the priority of one another, but now you have children, and now your children have to be your priority. And, uh, and then your children grow up, and they, they move away, and now you try to figure out who each other is in this empty nest kind of moment, and you're sad, and you miss the kids. Marriages oftentimes break up at that moment, too. And all of those reasons are, yeah, there are stresses on a marriage, but here's what no one really argues, and that is that infidelity is at the top of the list of hurting families, hurting people, and no one argues that infidelity is the hardest to overcome. You could go in, men, and uh, walk into the door of your home one evening, and you can say, sweetheart, I quit my job, and my boss asked me why. I punched him in the face. And I said, because you're a sorry sucker. And then they walked out. They called the police on me. And I hit the police officer. They're arresting me. And they're coming over here in just a moment. And you will do better than if you came home and said you're having an affair. <laughs> you can survive a lot of things easier than, than an, affair. an affair. Infidelity is the hardest thing for a marriage to overcome. And that's why 65% of couples that have infidelity in their marriage, 65% don't survive it when it happens. And, uh, and so here's your homework assignment. We were only able to read Proverbs 5, but I want you to read Proverbs 6 and Proverbs 7 as well because all three chapters talk about this, and you need to read it because you need more help, and, and your marriage needs more than simply what I'm saying to you at this moment. You need more than a sermon you need to go home and to really think about all of these things that we're talking about and, and put them into practice and pray about it and concentrate on it because if all you do to get some help in your marriage is you just hear a sermon, it's not going to do any good. You need to do more than this. And so please read the rest of these chapters and Proverbs. And if you do, you're going to find that there are several themes that relate to infidelity. Um, one of the themes is this, that infidelity is extremely tempting. It's tempting to every one of you, no matter how strong you think you might be. It is tempting. It says this, that infidelity, um, that the lips of an adulterer, that, that man or that woman, that there may be some kind of attraction, or there used to be an attraction, or there could be an attraction, that that person, the, the, the lips of an adulterer are like honey, and they just drip with a kind of sweetness. But then it says, but many are its victims. What a lot of preachers do when it talks about how, uh, how many people commit adultery 
is what, uh, you, you've probably heard this before, preachers will say, ah, look at all the celebrities, right? All the celebrities who have messed up, they've gotten divorced, they commit adulteries. Those celebrities, they can't ever stay together. And uh, preachers say that, and I think sometimes in, in Christians and in Sunday school classes, they'll say that kind of stuff. I think maybe they enjoy it a little too much. And the fact that we can make a list of people who we know that are celebrities or in the public eye who have committed adultery, the reason that we could make that list so quickly and just name them, name them, name them is probably a good reason why we should not just talk about them so easily and pile all the hurt onto all of those people. They're, they're already hurting enough without Christians and preachers just holding them up as the, uh, uh, as the perfect example of what not to be and how hurtful it is if we do that. And, Frankly, I don't know what the deal is. Sometimes Christians, we take pleasure in other people's pain. God, God help us and rescue us from that. But one of the reasons that we should never take um, uh, and, and make these lists real easy of all these other people, all the other people who have committed adultery and had affairs, here is the main reason why. And, in, and Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And <laughs> Look at this. The, the, this is really important. The reason we don't hold everybody else up and think that we're so safe is this. If you think you're standing firm and you're great, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall as well. Man, <clears throat> that's huge. <clears throat> Tucker. <clears throat> And now, love songs by Dory. This is the part of the show where Dory comes out and sings a love song. Hmm. Ross, you're getting to where you're like, expect it now. You're like, oh, <laughs> I just, I don't know when. <laughs> oh. Thank you, bud. I like love songs with Dory. It's kind of fun. I am, I, I am very, very nervous about next week's sermon, though. <laughs> Man. Well, if, if you would, put, put the scripture back up uh, on the <laughs> script for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's verse 12. The Apostle Paul said, If you think that you're standing firm, be careful, be very careful that you don't fall. The reality is nobody in this entire room that if you put yourself in the wrong place for long enough that you couldn't fall. No person, if you're in the wrong place and you put yourself there habitually for a long time that you couldn't fall. You could. 
and, 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 and a lot of very good people have. And so what we need to have is a humility to admit that, to say that I could fall, and that that humility makes me want to protect some things. The very fact to say, I could mess up everything. I could hurt my wife, and I could hurt our church, and I could hurt our children. The very fact to say that I could, and not to say that I'm bulletproof, and that I can flirt, and I can talk, and I can write these things online, and I can do all of this, and it's never going to hurt me, is, is, is so not true. And what we should be is humble to say, I could be my own worst enemy in regard to this, and to be humble. Humble enough to admit it and to say that because of the, um, uh, how easy it is for this to happen and the temptation of it, I must protect, protect myself well. Here's another theme. So not only is infidelity extremely, extremely tempting, infidelity also leads to ruin. In Proverbs 5 through 7, it says that it leads to a ruin. To ruin. It says that it, it'll take you down the highway to the grave. Um, if you want to mess up your life, this is the easiest and, and quickest way to do it. This is how you really, if you really want to hurt your life, having an affair is how you do it. Now, you'll hurt the per- your spouse, the person who loves you the most. You'll hurt them. You'll hurt your children. You will hurt other people's children and other people's families. You're, you'll hurt even, even your church. I've been in this position before where two people, one person had a... Uh, committed adultery, and then the other one um, was there, and they were innocent, but now they're going through a divorce. And they came to me, and, and, and they said, we can't be in church together because of all the pain that we're going through, so you tell him he can't come. And then he tells her, man, I need church right now, and I love my church. Tell her she can't come. And they're trying to make the church a part of the darn custody battle of it. That that at the same moment that you're dividing up all the kids and dividing up the possessions, now you have to say, well, who gets the church in the middle of the divorce? It hurts the church. It hurts your Sunday school classes. It kills it. It hurts your finances. Um, Nobody does better afterward. Um, in and, and, and affairs, uh, infidelity, it'll kill your finances. You, you, you'll be hurt by that. Your, your health deteriorates because of all the guilt and all of the stress. Uh, you want to see somebody who's really unhealthy, look at somebody who is not faithful to their spouse. They're not sleeping at night. Every time the phone rings, it makes them nervous. I mean, it, they, they, they get a text and they have to run over. I heard of one man, he, he had his phone, and he was so nervous about what somebody would see if they were standing to the right or to the left, but he, he made it. There, apparently, there is an app that you can only see what's on your phone if you're looking straight at it and not from the sides. Why would you need that? Unless you're pretty darn nervous, aren't you? You're sick. It, it makes you sick, and your stomach is all tied in knots. And uh, it leads to ruin. And, uh, and I know, though, that none of you are here because you want to hurt your life. All of you are here because you want to do what's right, and you want to protect your marriage, and so do I. We're here because our families mean a lot to us, and so how do we protect our families when uh, infidelity is very tempting and because it's dangerous? Well, how do we protect our families? Let me give you just a few very, very practical ideas. Now we're going into the practical side of all of this. You've seen the biblical side. So practically, what can we do? Here's what the wise person would do. Number one, married couples, do not play the comparison game in your marriage. It's easy to do, and it's very tempting, but it can be dangerous. One of the reasons that we don't need to ever play the comparison game is because we ain't good at it. We don't have enough wisdom to adequately compare our spouse to anybody else. We don't know all of that. Our understanding of other people's married uh, marriages and our understanding of other people's lives is incomplete. We don't know. We don't know what happens behind closed doors. 
The only time when we see people is mainly in public. And even if you go over to somebody's house, they're, they're, they're acting kind of publicly at the, in that moment. There is so much more that happens behind the curtain of public view that you don't know about. And we don't have enough of that behind the curtain information to make a comparison, to think that what we see in public is awesome and that this person is awesome. Why? Because you see them in public all the time. And then to think that they're better than, than, than your spouse, you don't have enough, I don't have enough information to make a fair comparison. Here's how it could foster infidelity. You compare someone that you see in public who is at their very best. You see them at church, you see them at work, you see them out and around, and they're at their best at that moment, and you compare their best, because that's what you see, to the person you wake up with in the morning. I mean, they just woke up. <laughs> just woke up. Their hair looks like a blender. You did it like that, and then their hair, they wake up, and it's matted, right? matted to their face just like this and they look up at you with one eye and they say go get the kids get the kids up it's time they have to get up and um and so you you, you say uh, and you get the alarm and you just want to crush it and and uh and, and you get up and then you walk around for a few minutes zombie like that's real attractive and, uh, and then you start dealing with your, your morning. You see your spouse at the end of the day, and they come home, and they're tired. Your spouse is tired. He or she has worked hard all day long, and he's too silent or she's too cranky. It's, it's not fair. We see them in every condition, every condition, which is not always at their best. This will be a shock to you. I don't always look as good as I do right now. <laughs> this is the best I got. <laughs> this is it. It doesn't get any better. It only gets worse. <laughs> and, and how unfair is it when, when we see our spouse in all of these conditions and we compare them to somebody else that we only see or only think and that, that we know in, at their very best. So when, when you look at a couple and you think, wow, what a couple, they look so happy, they look so good. If I could be married to somebody like that, then I could be happy too. Man, the grass isn't greener on the other side. That person deals with their own stuff too. That person gets mad. That person gets irritable. That person has their own issues going on. If you don't, we could take a poll that, to, to see who doesn't have their issues, and every one of you would raise your hand and say, we do. So the grass is not greener. Don't ever think that that other woman or that other man can make you more satisfied than the one that you're with. The thing is, is that your husband or your wife if you give them a chance, will make you happier than anybody else will. There is nothing that you need, men, nothing that you want, women, that your husband or your wife cannot provide for you. And it's going to be so much better when, when you do. And, and here's the other side of the comparison. The, don't play the comparison game, and one is seeing people who are really attractive and exciting and everything and thinking your life would be better. But here's the other side, and it's seeing a couple who are not very good. And uh, you go to dinner with them, and they fight and argue the whole time. And um, they say weird things, and then you get back in the car, and you say, Dang, I'm so glad we're not that couple. <laughs> Do you see how many problems they have? Man, divorce city. They're, they're headed. No, no. You don't know them. You don't know them. You know, sarcasm could be his love language. Who knows? <laughs> you don't know. And... But what we do is we think we know, and, and then we make these comparisons about all of it, but we shouldn't do that because we're not good enough at it. God knows us, and, and, and he is able to look at us and know because he sees everything. 
but we don't. Don't ever, ever, ever think that somebody that you met online, somebody that you met at work, or anybody in your life, no matter how kind they are, no matter how sweet they are to you, no matter how much they give you an attaboy and say that you're the best in the world, no matter what, don't ever, ever, ever think that they are better than the person that you're living with because they have issues too. Also, here's something else very practical. Put fences and boundaries up around your marriage. You need to talk with your wife, you need to talk to your husband, and find out what you need to do in order to give them security and, and create some real boundaries. Boundaries online. Who are they? Are they friends with people on Facebook that they may not need to be friends with? Talk about that. Are they doing something that makes you feel uncomfortable? Talk about that so that you can build a boundary and create some real rules for your relationship because now let's talk about this. That Ashley Madison, okay, th th that's different than most of, most of us. Um, those are people who are trying and looking to do that, but most of us here, we're not trying to look for uh, adultery. We're not trying to do all of that. And so do you realize that most of the people who have affairs extramarital marital situations, they don't intend to do it. They're not getting on websites and looking for it. Most of people who do it are just like me and you. They, they don't intend for it to happen. And if you ask them after the fact how it happened, they're going to say, I don't know. It just kind of evolved. And it does because most of the time, infidelity starts with two people who are just friends. And, and the friendship starts to meet an emotional need. And then the friendship of this meeting of the need, it can go into other types of things. Dr. Kenneth, uh, Dr. Coffrin um, Broderick says, I'm convinced that more people get themselves into the pain of infidelity through concern and compassion more than any other base motive. Because the world is full of lonely and vulnerable people who are desperate for a sympathetic ear or a shoulder to cry on. And when people come and they're that lonely and you, uh, you, you give concern and compassion for them and you start meeting their emotional need, it is very easy for them to become attracted to you. And that's why the number one place where infidelity takes place is, is in work, in the workplace, with the men and women that you work with where inappropriate friendships can occur very easily. Somebody will ask, well, then, Ross, can I be friends with somebody of the opposite sex? Yeah, you, you can. Yes, of course. But do not. You never want to put yourself in a position where someone other than your spouse is meeting your emotional needs, whether that's online or at work or anywhere. And anytime someone other than your spouse is meeting your emotional needs, then there are not very many steps from that place into infidelity. You're closer to it. If there's somebody in your life right now and they're meeting your emotional needs, you're closer to infidelity than you think that you are. It's that dangerous. And, and you know what? You don't want to be that person for somebody else either. Um, sometimes you think, oh, I'm just being a good friend. I'm just giving them a listening ear. But they are on a different path than you, and they're being drawn very emotionally close to you, nearer to you than you are to them. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're saying they love you, and they're writing you stuff, and they're, they're tempting you. And, and, and you're like, whoa, I thought we were just friends. They were on a different path than you were, and this happens all the time. You don't need to be an emotional confidant or an emotional counselor for somebody of the opposite sex. And, and why? Why am I, being, am I being too hard about this? I, I don't think I am either. And I think the reason, y'all, we're trying to protect our marriages here. Amen. That's why. We're trying to protect our marriages. And infidelity almost always begins with an emotional connection with somebody else. So if you think that I'm being too hard, you, you, you'll find out. If you want to ignore all of this, you'll find out, and it won't be, it won't be fun, that that emotional connection led to some place where, where you really didn't want it to go. And, but when it's happening to you, you know. You know when you start to feel that way. It's the feeling and the emotion inside of you when somebody else 
other than your spouse is starting to meet your own needs, be aware of your own emotions so that if you start to feel really good because this other person is meeting your need for affection or your need for attention, your need for affirmation, and they're just affirming you and telling you good things, stroking your ego, and, and, and you know what? That feels good. We all want approval and we all want um, compliments. It's nice, but when you share when you share with that person who's giving you all of that atten attention and you start to divulge things about your personal life and personal issues and then they meet your needs even more and then your hands touch and, and it's bad and you're spending a little bit more time with them than you should, man, it can happen fast. Sometimes, though, people play it like this. They don't want to do anything overtly with somebody else that can be pinned on them. And so what they do is they just kind of play it cool and they deny that anything really is going on between the person, but they flirt with people. And they call it innocent flirting. And, uh, but it's, it's something so that if somebody, they, they try to just flirt innocently and then if somebody comes up and says, man, is something going on? They get real defensive about it. And, uh, or maybe they, they just look for a per, they, they look forward to being with this other person more than they look forward to being with their spouse. Is there anyone in your life, at work, somewhere else, and you look forward to being with that other woman or that other man, you look forward to being with them more than you look forward to being with your spouse? Or maybe you hide it. You kind of hide that relationship because it's already something you feel a little guilty about, so you hide it, and maybe you're even a little deceptive about it. And you don't, you, you, you don't tell everything. Y'all, a relationship with the opposite sex can be considered an, um, an emotional infidelity anytime it becomes that personal. But I want you to know that it crosses the line and it is infidelity when, when it's kept secret from your spouse or it's lied about or it violates the boundaries and the rules that you and your spouse have created for each other or it involves behavior that you wouldn't do if your spouse were right there next to you. And if you act one way with somebody of the opposite sex, and you would not do that if your spouse were right there, that's wrong. That is a movement toward infidelity. And so if any of us are on that kind of path, run as fast as you can toward your marriage. Run back toward your spouse, toward them, and, and, and make that choice because it will lead you to ruin if you don't. Um, it will take you further than you ever, ever wanted to go. The Bible says here in Proverbs 6, 27 and 28, can a man walk on hot coals and not get burned? It's a rhetorical question. No. <laughs> You're going to get hurt. Don't walk on the hot coals. Don't flirt. Don't have an emotional connection with somebody. Don't do that. No. You're going to get burned by the hot coals that you decided to walk on. Don't set a trap for yourself. It's going to lead to so much pain, so much misery. And, um, and know this, that in your marriage, this is very practical. If you want to protect your marriage, then become the host in your marriage instead of the guest. If you're in a hotel, there's a certain way, if you're the manager, that you treat your guests. And that is, what do you need? What do you need? I'm meeting all of those needs. The host does that for the guest. If in your marriage you act like you are the perpetual guest and your wife or your husband has to meet all of your needs all the time but you never take the place of the host, then eventually they're going to feel very disconnected from you and they're going to feel lonely and isolated and it might push them away. There are needs that your spouse has all kinds of needs and you have to meet those so you have to be the host often and not just the guest but this happens all the time there are adults who are still living like their children and and y'all know what children are they're just wonderful little bundles of selfish ego <laughs> and they say me 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 and uh, and that's fine because they're kids What's not fine is when you have a 45-year-old adult married person and they're still living like that as well. And uh, you end up, when, when, when you're having to be the host and they're always the guest, saying me, 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 
And you know what happens? You, you, you end up walking on eggshells all the time. I just don't want to make them mad. I better not say this. I better not do that. It's going to make them mad. And that's no way to, to live. It's like when the wife becomes timid and, and the wife says, Oh, I better not do this or I better not do that. Because the guest in the house, the husband, it's all about him all the time and what he wants and what he thinks. And I better not do all of this because it's just going to frustrate him. Man, how, how can, men, how can your wife live as the perpetual host? And all, it happens on the other side. I see it a lot too. Where the husband is intimidated by the wife because he just, he, he, he thinks, man, I'm scared of that mood. You know, that that mood and he, so he walks around on eggshells and he's just kind of creeping around the house he'll he'll turn the football game on just for a second to hear the score and she goes what's that from the nothing nothing it's nothing from the other room um where he he, he creeps in and he says you know some of the guys were thinking possibly maybe some of them were going hunting but i didn't really want to go but they really want to go what, what, what do you think it would be in just creeping, creeping, hoping that she doesn't get mad, hoping that she doesn't get mad about something? My goodness. You know what? If, if you're always playing the host and the other person is always playing the guest, it's not going to be good. But some people live like that all the time. One person just acts like they're the host and the other has to be the guest all the time. And, and it'll hurt you. It's like the story of that one husband and wife and the husband is very sick. And they, they go to the doctor, and after they go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, I need to talk to y'all, and he's talking to them for a while, and finally, I mean, the husband's really, really sick, and he says, sir, I need you to leave the room. I just need to talk to your spouse for a minute, and, and he says, ma'am, I want you to know that your husband, there is a very good chance that he's going to die unless you really create a better environment. He, he needs to eat really well, and you need, to, you need to alleviate every bit of stress from his life, every bit. You treat him like he is a guest in the house, and you, do, you meet all of his needs. You cook every meal. You, you clean up everything. You just let him sit and relax because his heart can't take a whole lot else. And you need to do everything you can, be at his beck and call. And so she walks out, and, and the poor sick husband, she, he says, well, what did the doctor say? And she said, the doctor said, you're going to die. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> in a marriage, in a marriage, there are all these needs, and you have to meet them. There are social needs. There are sexual needs. Yeah, we're talking about that next week. It's big. We're talking about psychological needs. And there are psychological needs uh, that your spouse has. There are spiritual needs, and there are emotional needs. And in a good marriage, both the husband and the wife are meeting all of them. All of them. And, and, and in a place where the husband and wife are meeting all of those needs, there is no room for infidelity. Amen. That's what you do. You build the wall around, and there's no room for infidelity. There's an old football adage that says that the greatest um, defense is a good offense. And then I've also heard that defense wins championships. <laughs> so which one is it? It's both, isn't it? When a good marriage, you build boundaries around your, your marriage, but then you're also on the offense, and you're trying to be a host, and you're loving, and you're treating them like they're the guest. And when you have both people doing that, it'll keep away infidelity. And, and, and here's something really good. Don't, when you're in a conversation, when you're in an argument with each other, don't saw sawdust. What does that mean? Um, once something has already been discussed, a painful issue in your past, and you've already discussed it, you've already sawed it, it's been sawed, don't keep sawing it over and over again. Don't keep bringing it back up. That's sawing sawdust. And, and, and so when you're in an argument, and by the way, it's good to have an argument. The, the danger is when couples are silent and they're not talking about their feelings and they're not talking about the stuff. When you're silent, those are the marriages that are in the most danger. You all need to have arguments from time to time. Just 
When you argue with one another, don't hurt each other. Be kind to each other in the middle of the argument. It's okay to do that. And, um, but when you're having these arguments, if you've already discussed something, don't bring it back up. Don't saw sawdust because what happens is in the middle of an argument, one person is really mad at the other one, and they bring up, back up, that really painful mistake. And they bring that back up, not because they need closure and not because it'll help, but because they're trying to hurt this person just as much as they perceive that person is trying to hurt them. And so they bring it back up. But here's the problem. If you keep sawing sawdust, nothing is ever resolved. And, and right now, you may have been married 25 uh, or 30 years, but the fact is you could be married 50 years and still harbor bitterness about that thing a long time ago. Today, let go of that. Let go of those issues so that your marriage can move forward. Don't keep sawing sawdust. I mean, if, even if the worst has happened, if infidelity has happened in your life, and if it is, I'm so sorry. But if that's happened, psychologists say that it will take 18 months to two years to begin, to begin to overcome that pain and to be able to take a step forward and trust that person again. So the pain will stay there. Trust issues will be there for a while, but if you work hard, you can overcome even infidelity. You can do that, but there has to come a time when you stop bringing it back up. If you've already talked about it, and that was a long time ago, don't keep bringing the infidelity back up and back up. They're trying to get over it. They're sorry. And so don't keep sawing sawdust. And so last, I'll mention this, and this is a fun one. This is a way to be on the offensive. I want you to protect your marriage by having and starting an affair in your marriage. For some people, if they would work as hard at their marriage as they do uh, at having an affair, then their marriage would be pretty good. It takes a lot of work, I've heard, for people to be unfaithful to each other and to have lots of different... Um, websites and other people who are calling and writing things and you have to erase all this stuff all the time. It takes a lot of work to send all the special flowers and to keep up with lots of different people. Here's my children, here's my wife, here's this other lady, or here's this other man. It takes a lot of work to figure out your schedule and how you're going to be with all of these people. And the thing is, if people would put that much work and effort into their own spouse, if you will commit to having an affair with your husband or your wife and to working that hard, as hard as all of the other people do at being unfaithful, if you would work that hard being faithful, then, then it would go well. All you need and all you want is found in your spouse. There's a story about a very wealthy man from the Middle East named al Hafed. And he had everything going for, the, for him. He was very successful. He was very wealthy. He had a lot of land, and he had a great family. But one day, a priest came to him. And as they were talking, uh, the man talked about, the priest talked about these miraculous things called diamonds. And he said that diamonds were crystallized sunlight. And, uh, and al Hafed became fascinated by them. The priest said that diamonds were the last and highest of all of God's creations. And, and, and Al Hafed, this, this very wealthy man, became obsessed. And, and he thought, I've got to have them. I have to find diamonds. And so he left his home and he left his land in search for him. And he went all over the world and he gave up his whole life searching for these diamonds. And, and finally, toward the end of his life, he hadn't found anything. And he had been to Africa and the United States and in China. He had been all over the world and giving all of his money and all of his time tirelessly to find them. And finally, he was in Spain, and he was old. He was depressed. He was lonely. He had given up everything, and it all came out to nothing. And so one day, he's in Barcelona, Spain. And as the, the story goes, is that he was so depressed for never finding anything, he just walked into the sea and he kept walking and he drowned himself out in the water of the sea. A while later, another man buys his vast land. And as this new person who owned his land was one day out riding a camel in what used to be the backyard of Alpha Fed, where a stream went through his back pasture, he was riding his camel and he saw glimmering there in the water something and he got off of his camel and he went and he picked it up and it was a huge huge beautiful diamond 
And so the, the story said that that place, that al Hafed, his land, was the very beginning of what became the crown jewels of that country, where they said the Golmana gold mines and all of the jewels came from that one area of al Hafed's land. I think about that story as I look out at all of you. I look out at all of you and see married couples all over this room. And the truth about your life and what you need to be the happiest is fulfilled in your own home. Amen. Your own home. Let me challenge you then to have an affair with in your own marriage. Do something crazy with your husbands, wives. Do something exciting. Buy your spouse something in secret that he or she doesn't know about. Sneak off. Sneak off together with your spouse. All of the work that you could do, do it with one another. And always remember this, that there is a huge difference in being a great parent and being a great spouse. You could be the best dad or the best mom in the world and be a lousy husband. And wives, you could be a great mommy. Your children love you and you connect with them. A great mommy, but you're not a very good wife. There is a difference between the two. And so begin an affair today. Life is short. Have an affair, but have it with your own husband or your own wife. And if you do, people are always going to, you're going to keep people guessing. You're going to keep people guessing. If you're sleeping, having sex with your own wife, people will say, my goodness, what, what a crazy person this is. He, uh, we, we don't know much about somebody who is that faithful, but that satisfied and that happy all at the same time, all at the same time. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it is that God has given you a special someone with which to share all of life's adventures all of life's adventures through all the ups and all the downs and you will grow old together and you will keep away all the infidelity and all the affairs when you concentrate on each other man y'all look good together y'all are good looking couples and i love you stay strong together bow your heads with me will you commit to building boundaries around your marriage. Please don't let this be the end of the conversation. There is more to come as far as protecting your marriages. There is more. Build a boundary around it. Don't commit infidelity. Be close to your spouse. Be close to them. Meet their needs. Be the host. And know that infidelity is always knocking at your door. Wives, there is another woman out there who wants your husband, and the devil will introduce them. Amen. In the same, same way, men, there is another man out there. Don't let that guy meet your wife's emotional needs. The devil will introduce them somehow. Don't let that happen. You be the one. You be the one, man. You've been watching the First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas video podcast. Be sure to check back each and every Monday for new sermons by visiting us online at fbcmf.org.